Sarah Riccardi from um, Art of Cross, and she's our art historian. And we've got six of the nine artists who are in our current exhibition. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the other two. And do, there will be um, a break in the middle, so you can stop there. And is it questions at the end, Sarah, or questions? We hope so. We hope to have time. Yes. So you don't want them to interrupt while you're talking? Well, unless you are really bursting for <laughs> any pressing we, we We will try to keep a steady schedule so that you have time to discuss at the end. Thank you. I'll hand over to Sarah. Right. Thank you, Kathy. So, where the fire exits were. The fire exits, you have to break that window. Oh, <laughs> it's the door you came in. <laughs> right. I'm really delighted to be taking part in this tonight. And because the theme of materials, which is the theme of this exhibition, is extremely stimulating as a theme, as viewers, us, rather than makers, it can not always be immediate to think about all the process that's behind an artwork when we are faced with it in its final stage. But actually, all those processes are absolutely vital and are part of the final object. And moreover, to me, as an art historian, it's very important when I look at a piece of art and I try to analyze it and to understand it, to place it in that reticulum of connections with other pieces of art. I always start from the object itself and from its material characteristics. And even if I don't know who the artist is or when or where a piece of art has been made, if I can collect some information about its material qualities, it is already a reliable starting point. So it was a real delight and a privilege to be able to discuss this theme so deeply with such a varied array of talents. And I would like to start with Susan, whose practice um, is very based on the materials and her kind of manipulation of it is absolutely unique. Um, I will just start with a question, but you can go and express whatever you feel. Would you consider that first you realised the, that the material qualities of the media you were using allowed to certain effects and then went on exploring them? Or did you first want to put uh, your research towards certain visual effects? and search for media that allowed you to do that? Um, I think to begin with, I was just uh, really interested in the idea of the gesso ground. Um, I first came across it when I was my first year on foundation at art school. And um, someone, one of the tutors or someone said, this is the artist Bible, it was Ralph Mayer book of um, painting and the history of materials. So I was going through this kind of huge recipe book of, of pigments and, and all these different types of paint, encaustic, gesso, um, and various um, substances. And what really struck me um, about the idea of gesso um, was the fact that it had been used for centuries, um, that Michelangelo, um, painters since the Renaissance, had used it as a ground to paint on. So to begin with, I, I didn't really go into, um, go into using it with any particular idea in mind. Um, what I did was I just wanted to experience the making of it, and, and traditionally it's white because it's made with calcium carbonate or chalk, um, as I said, a, a, as a ground to paint on. Um, so at that time, techniques and various things like that weren't taught in art schools. It was very much up to your own kind of way of researching and going about it. But I did find a tutor who had used it in the past, um, who, who kind of led me to um, using it. And I had to do it in the workshop because of the heating of the um, rabbit skin glue, etc. So I followed the recipe, basically, um, and but, to begin with, I did it wrong. Um, the surface cracked and it peeled off, and 
I used um, the rabbit skin glue beforehand and I put too much on. So all these kind of accidents happened, um, which I thought actually were quite interesting. Um, and then I learned how to do it properly and to make a pure marble surface and to rub it down and sand it down, which was fantastic. But then I kind of went back to thinking about the mistakes that I'd made and how in some ways that was quite unique and it's quite interesting. Um, so I made these paintings um, that, and they all cracked and my tutor said, this is bearing in mind this is art school when you're, you're encouraged to experiment and push the boundaries. Oh, you can't do that. It's not meant to be used in that way and, you know, it's all wrong. So I thought, well, actually, why is it wrong, you know? Um, and in Ralph Mayer's book, he says that cracks appearing on newly made gesso are highly undesirable. So they're considered uh, technically a flaw um, in, in, in the process of what you've done. So I like the idea that it was a flaw, it was a defect, and it was, um, it was unique. And every time I kind of made these surfaces or paintings, they were all different and I couldn't make them twice. You know, I would do the same, exactly the same process on maybe six different pieces and they would all behave differently, they would crack differently. So then I started um, experimenting with the consistency of the gesso to see the very, very kind of um, features that I could provoke. And then also I've experimented with um, the temperature at which the gesso dries out. Um, and leading on from that, when I, <clears throat> my work became kind of a little bit more, um, what's the word, uh, more technical, um, once I'd mastered that kind of area, um, I used the tension in the canvas as also to, to, to create the fissures as well. Um, some of my larger works, which you, you don't see here, but you will see at some point, um, the divided canvas is painted on um, the areas that are marked out or masked off. So I would say, for instance, on a divided canvas that's five foot wide, I would paint on the gesso and go through the process and it would be, become very hard, very, um, very strong and very brittle. Um, then the process of, of kind of rubbing down with, <clears throat> I use wet canvas and water, so it's just like putting the pigment back into the surface. And then I use natural beeswax and, and, and some linseed oil that I source. And, and then once that's done, that's just like a pure marble surface with no cracks. And then I mask that off and then the other side, um, I begin the process of painting on the gesso. Um, and this is the kind of more elaborate technique that I use in the fact that because of the play of wet and dry between the two, two surfaces, you then get a movement in, in the tension of the canvas which creates these cracks and fissures in, in the surface. So, um, so I've experimented in lots of ways to provoke these flaws. Um, I really, every time I make a painting, I don't know what's going to happen. And that's what excites me. Because to begin with, when I was at art school, I, I, I'd always been technically quite good at drawing and making beautiful work. But I kind of had the idea, progressively, that I wanted to make something that um, was kind of outside of myself, that wasn't... Um, down to my technical brilliance but was down to the material because I actually fell in love with the surface and and what what I really like about um, doing making the work that I make is every time I make a painting I think oh I could maybe do this a little bit differently or I could do that a little bit differently or um, you know I, I, I still feel that there's so much more to explore um, I had lunch um, with a curator friend of mine who supported me um, over a number of years from being a student um, when I had a show <clears throat> at Mandel's Gallery in Norwich last year and she said, Susan, she said, you must be the technical expert of gesso in the whole of the country. You've been doing it for so long now. And, and I thought, actually, 
I have been doing it quite a while. It's been like <coughs> 14 years, 15 years, and I really still think that I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I, I really still think that there's so much more to do. That um, yeah, I've so much more to to kind of explore and expand on, um, even with different forms and the way they're divided geometrically as well. So that's kind of my story. But also, <clears throat> I've used um, I substituted the the chalk with um, a lamplac pigment, which for me, and at this time, so I was born in the northwest from a mining family, working class background in West Orton, and I moved, I uh, lost my parents, and I moved to, to Norfolk, where I was at art school and kind of um, continuing my art practice. And when I was using the lamplac pigment and making these paintings, um, what really... Um, struck me was the fact that it was just so dirty and so grimy and one of my first memories was of my mother telling me about um, kind of my uncles and people coming home from the pit um, and how they couldn't get the dirt out of their fingernails and they had a bath in front of the fire in the tin bath and um, and that kind of resonated with me. I mean that, that's not why I made the work but that was just an insight into how I kind of think about it. I'm not saying you should see coal mines or anything like that, but that's just an insight into kind of why it appeals to me. Um, and also, I like the idea that it's natural um, and organic. I, I like the idea that it's kind of alive somehow. So, Thank you. you. Yeah, well, that's extremely fascinating, okay. and it's very relevant, and it's very poignant to the whole thing that your research really started from exploring the material and mm -hmm. from experimenting with its qualities. And I feel your story makes me reflect on the fact that some materials have very specific features and I don't think you couldn't possibly force any other material to react as the gesso with beeswax does to get your craft pieces. So with a mental association, I was thinking about other materials who, which have strong features and that influenced the development of the history of art. As an example, in the 15th century, painters were faced with somehow a choice. Now, if you walk in an art gallery today, and if you go in the 18th century painting room, for example, you will mainly probably find paintings which are made in oil paint. But if you walk in a 13th century painting room, they will mainly bear tempera paint on the labels. So tempera paint is a painting which uses egg yolk as a binder, which is mixed to the ground colors to get the to, to the ground pigments to get the color, and it results in a quite thick and quickly drying kind of color. Um, so um, in uh, during the medieval times, when artists were re representing a world which was mainly symbolic, with the golden background panels, with the religious stiff and symbolic figures on them, they worked well with a painting with the qualities of tempera. Oil paint, on the other side, um, uses oils in the place of egg yolk to be mixed to the ground pigments and the color that results is quite transparent and liquid and it can be worked in layers. So <coughs> if you can think, for example, at Flemish, Flemish painted, paintings with all those reflections of light on metals, on brass, or the uh, glass jars half full of water in which you can really see the transparency you will see that these effects started to appear 
when Flemish painters began to experiment with oil paint, as effects of transparency are way easier to get with a liquid painting as oil. So why did artists in the 15th century begin to use oil instead of tempera? And this is somehow the, a similar question to the one uh, I started with. So we can't know whether they wanted to represent something new, something in a different way, and so sought for materials that would allow them to do so, or if they realized oil allowed to a certain effect and went on exploring these effects. What we do know is that during the 15th century, there was being a shift in taste and artists were getting more interested in the representation of the naturalistic effects in the natural world, in the earthy world, and less interested in the medieval symbolic representations. And we also know that effects such as the reflections of light on metals or transparencies of water or glass do add to the feeling of naturalism in picture. So this uh, combination of the practical capacity and the qualities of different media and the aesthetical research of the artist is very strict. And we, again, we can't know what happened, but I find it very fascinating to realize how the practical aspect influences the visual aesthetical result. And um, Susan's experience also tells about the importance of knowing how you can handle your medium and which effects you can get with it so that you can go on and explore them. And I think this is something that links her work to Rachel's work as the material is a very important starting point for her as well as you will tell us. Okay. Right, I'm a, I call myself a, a ceramic sculptor, which I suppose really I'm a sculptor, but the ceramic aspect is um, very important to me. And my work's over on the um, sideboard over there. Um, I first sort of learnt the, the technicalities of ceramic, uh, of, of using clay on foundation course. Um, because it was just a one-year course, I, I learned sort of quite a limited range of skills. I used mostly kind of slab building techniques. So you're building, well, I always chose to, to use sculptural forms in uh, kind of vertical walls. You build building walls out of clay. Um, and so I, I, I actually then went on to do a degree in interior design. And I have then continued to practice as an interior designer in an architectural practice, but always kept my ceramics as a, 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 a parallel um, career. Um, and I, I like that kind of combination of, of the kind of working large, large scale in, in architecture and contrasting it with the small handheld scale of, of the ceramics. Uh, there's also the contrast of um, working where you've got a lot of constraints in, in architecture and you don't handle the materials yourself, but then the ceramic of, of very much handling the material and having much more control over what you do. Um, but I got to the stage, I, I, I used to do work that was um, just all slab building, and I got to the point where I was developing work and my abilities with the material were letting me down. My knowledge of, of slab building kind of only led me so far, and I needed to um, become more proficient with the material. And because I, I'd only had very limited um, kind of education in clay, I, I kind of didn't know how to, to, to move, move on, really. So I went to do an MA. Um, did it at uh, UCLan in Preston, and I then was introduced to the technique of using working in solid clay, which it's not totally unusual. It's quite unusual, um, and it's a, a technique where you can really push the material and and um, I sort of impress things into it. I twist it. I sometimes tear the clay, and it gives you that uh, ability to. Um, mark make in a particular way and I, I really like the way of working solid. Uh, I was also introduced to the idea of, of, of 
putting colour into the clay so because it's solid the colour goes all the way way through the clay um, and I was also introduced to a new type of clay which is the porcelain the Parian porcelain and that's a, um, a, a porcelain which has a high glass content so that's why it has a, quite a sheen to it uh, I was I'm always very interested in that idea of of sort of working against what a material is traditionally used for. So I've never been interested in making vessels. I don't know why, I've just always liked the idea of doing abstract work. But I like the idea of using a very functional material. You know, clay is usually used for, for mugs, for teapots, for toilet bowls, shower trays, wash on basins, all those kind of practical things. And my work is resolutely not practical um, and it's not functional. But I, I, I like the, the idea that the, the, the material is also incredibly resilient. And once you, you make a mark when the clay is wet, it's fixed forever in the kiln. So it's then Im immovable then. Um, it's, it's so resilient. It's one of those earliest materials that we've got, got left of the very earliest civilizations are, off, are often um, things made of clay, you know, the earliest... Um, evidence of right human being humans being able to write is in in clay tablets um, so, so my work developed uh, in the in this solid way um, and against the the traditions of the material like the porcelain porcelain is usually a very delicate material and I like the idea that my work is the porcelain work is still solid um, I also have a um, an understanding of what Susan's talking about if when when you have a knowledge of the material, you then play play around with that knowledge, um, but you're working against it as well, and you're pushing the material as far as you can, as, as much as you can, to try and do make it do sort of things it doesn't naturally want to do. Um, but at the same time, you're the what the reason I wanted to change my work from being slab built to being in the the solid form is that I felt my work was, um, I was trying to get these very kind of straight lines in the clay and a very kind of rigid look to things. And I realised that I was asking the clay to do things that would actually be easier to do in wood or stone or, or you know, some other material other than clay. And I thought, well, what's the point doing that? You might as well use another material. So that's why I developed a way of working which I thought you can only make this in clay and so I've always been interested in making work that responds to the clay, responds to the material and doesn't go against it so although I'm it's like that contradiction of, of trying to push the material and make it do things uh, to its kind of limits but at the same time I still want it to look like clay um, and so there's, there's been a, you know, like Susan, a lot of tests that I've done of trying things out, firing very, very slowly. Um, the uh, stoneware clay, I use stoneware clay so it goes up to a very high temperature, but very, very slowly to avoid all the cracking. So I've sort of eliminated uh, the cracks developing in the firing by firing very slowly. Um, I also like the way that with clay, it's a two-way process. I will have an idea of what I want to make, and my work is quite influenced by architecture, but I won't have a fixed idea of today I'm going to make a pot that's, you know, this, this and this, because I realise you, you can't impose on the material too much. You can have an idea and you can work with it, but it's a two-way process. The clay the clay has something to say in it as well. It's like a, a conversation between you and the material. Um, I'm also, my, the scale of my work is, uh, is kind of domestic and handheld, and that's a combination of the material and me. So the, the material um, will only fire solid up to a certain size before you have serious problems. But also, um, the size of my hands and the size of me limit, limits it because clay when it's wet and it's solid is very heavy and I can only uh, use, you know, work to a certain scale where I have control over the material um, and so that, that limits, so it's a very physical relationship with the material, a kind of a very physical intimate relationship with the material. Um, I think that the other thing that I've gone on to since 
these pieces. So this is very recent. Um, I started digging my own clay um, because I like the idea of clay representing uh, a locality, where it's from. So I've dug some local clay, which I found when I got it out of the kiln, I found it was exactly the same colour as the bricks of the kiln shed where my, my kiln is, because it was local and obviously the bricks of the kiln shed must have been, been dug locally. Um, and I did a ceramic residency in Rome earlier this year where I dug local clay in Rome. And that was interesting because I found that the colour of the clay was the colour of some of the, the buildings, but not the Roman buildings. They were much later buildings because I was obviously digging clay in an area that sort of post-Renaissance buildings were, their, their clay bricks were, were dug there. And that was an interesting way of understanding and appreciating uh, a foreign city and getting to know it and responding to it. Uh, and so I'm sort of moving into the idea that my work is about the clay, it's about material, but it's also about locality. And it's about how you uh, respond to a locality and how your work represents uh, both you, but also the place that it's made or the place that it's from. Um, and I think that's... Yeah, thanks, Rio. That's yeah. yeah. brilliant. <laughs> and personally, I love the passion when you talk about the material. When you said it's almost an intimate relation. Yeah. It really comes across both from what you have said, but also from the pieces themselves. Um, it's very relevant that you mentioned that clay does something that other materials don't do and some things you were trying to do, you thought, well, I could do that in other materials such as wood or marble, you said. Mm. Um, that's nice because in the, uh, well, from the 15th, 16th century, there has been a whole dispute on the, in the field of sculpture about the different materials that are used for sculptures, which were divided depending on the ways in which they had to be worked. So the scholars and writers and artists at the time divided those materials that have to be worked by adding the material and manipulating it and putting it into shape, such as clay or ceramics, and those materials that are worked by removing part of it, by carving it, such as wood or marble. So they, these two categories are different, and uh, people from the past had realized it um, already. And it was a very intense dispute, and there were strong philosophical reasons behind it. And Michelangelo, to mention one of the best known, was highly opinionated in that, as he believed the work of the artist, his work, was just to let the artwork come to light, but that the artwork itself was already somehow contained within the block of marble. So he believed that his role was simply to remove the excess of material that was rocking the artwork already there. So of course, if you see it from this point of view, from his point of view, this could have been done only with the materials that had to be worked by removing. So, in his case, mainly marble. And then, as the aesthetical criterion changed in the 17th century, the whole attitude towards the different materials changed as well, as during the Baroque period, Artists were more interested in exploring the passion and the human emotions and they wanted their pieces to convey that emotion rather than searching for models of ideal beauty as the art of Michelangelo did. And they realized that materials that are worked by adding and modeling it retained more of the immediate inspiration of the artist. So they realized that materials such as ceramics or clay, as Rachel has found out as well, they do have that capacity of conveying, of fixing a moment which is a dynamic moment, a moment in which the bare hands of the artist have been 
on the material, they, these materials can keep it and keep on conveying it. Um, actually, during the Baroque, the final pieces were still in marble most of the times, but artists began to create clay models first so that they could create the image with the impression of their inspiration and that they based the final pieces on that model to try and keep that dynamic quality on the final piece. So again, this is another way of looking at how the practical aspects of material have a great influence and they have even been object of philosophical bias. Um, so to move on, to move on, uh, in your, in two, so far we have seen how artists can start from the material and from the material's quality, starting from that and then seeing where the research takes them. But I think it can also happen the other way around. So there can be a concept, a strong idea, and then there, there can be a research of materials that can somehow allow to convey that concept. So Emma, do you want to okay. talk a bit about that? As an artist working across different media, I'm interested in understanding the connotations of materials and how they can shape an artwork's narrative. For me, materials are as integral to the process of making and viewing as the concept. They should enhance comprehension and reflect the ideas I'm exploring. This means I'm not drawn to their physical properties alone. The medium has a capacity to connect with the viewer's memory and prior experiences. In many respects, it could be posited that I'm exploring our cognition of matter. I'm particularly drawn to materials which promote curiosity. Tactile mediums entice the viewer into experiencing through touch, yet the fragility of the forms I create with paper or books mean that this particular sense is unable to be applied. You're invited in, yet held at a distance. The viewer is forced to interact with their eyes instead of their fingertips something we are not accustomed to, given the nature of the material used in the sculpture's construction. This is somewhat jarring, yet feels appropriate when we examine much of our communication in the digital age. Despite technological advances, books are still a common part of our lives. They are containers of information, history, thoughts, tales, material for imagination and facilitators of learning. There is something about the tactile nature of books, the experience of leafing through the printed page, and the smell of brown paper, which cannot be replicated by the digital world. Books are a wider sensory experience than one may initially assume. In a world of supposedly personalised digital content, printed word and images hold even greater value. It is intimate and personal. We connect and engage with it in a different way to any device with a screen. In their digital form, things are often stripped down to their most simplistic state, music becoming just sound, a book only words. Physical interaction is such a huge part of the experience which is sadly missed through this digital formatting. And from recently published figures regarding the sales of books and vinyl, it is possible to draw conclusions that it's something that we yearn for as beings. When sculpting with books, I pay close attention to the titles I select. By bringing in something familiar and making alterations, I aim to encourage the observation of materials around us. There is very little left to chance. Along with their physical qualities as a material, it is a matter of thought, matter constructed from matter. With transition one, which you can see on the wall just there, um, I employed the use of a number of historical books, the most dominant of the texts being by Arthur Mee. I remember seeing many of these books housed in my dad's bookcase as a child. A great example of subjective historical writing with a distinctly patriotic tone, which was very typical of the time. The nature of these books and the fact that many of his works were written for children felt highly appropriate in the construction of the piece, given the ideas I am exploring. Both my dad and the previous owner of the books I have used in the piece um, had won them as prizes in school. The fact that these materials have a form of purpose adds to their meaning and again is something that I am sympathetic towards in my adoption of such media in my pieces. Emergence, which you see there, 
um, is an exploration of the development of self and identity, and that piece was formed from an encyclopedia and an illustrated copy of Darwin's Origin of Species. A title suitability for sculpting is assessed through touch and sight. I choose strongly bound hardback books, as the bindings themselves can cause difficulties in the process if not considered carefully. The selection of paper is formed from my experiences of using the medium to sculpt. Heavier materials work more successfully since they retain their shape and are less likely to buckle during the processing. The bald sculptures, which you see there, um, and another one right at the back, <coughs> another time, another place, um, explore the sense of touch too, but the purpose of these forms differs to the other sculptures I produce. These works are designed to be physically interacted with. They are a familiar implement. Most of us have in experienced interaction with them from a very young age. The memory of these materials brings forth an automatic response. As with the components used to form the design, we observe and interact without thinking about the subtle qualities of that interaction. With regard to the prints themselves, I am identifying and using the movements we make in order to create the images. Balls are thrown, squashed or rolled onto the paper, documenting the textures of the area or place, whilst reflecting its identity through the process to typography, type roots and graffiti. The collection of type was an exercise in observation, looking for hidden and unexpected along with the explicit. How often do we read without noticing the subtleties of communication or consider the suggestions and feelings that contribute to our assessment of a place? The shapes and styles we are presented with tap into our subconscious. We unknowingly view these characteristics and form judgments centred on the fonts, the clothes that letters wear. Rendering and gridlock, which are the two pieces that are on the corridor at the back, <laughs> um, <coughs> are an expansion of these ideas. Print is traditionally a very structured medium, planned at every stage in order to create an addition with very little left to chance. I've spent a number of years exploring the idea of print being the first step and not the final. Drawing has long been used as a way for artists to take visual notes, quickly capture information and organise, a tool for processing. The medium drawing is often seen as immediate, flexible and economic. The reworked prints I create turn this premise on its head. Drawing extends the process of making. Its marks are confined, restricted by the parameters provided by the graph paper's grid. My process certainly reflects the intimate nature of drawing, yet the information contained within each square is flat. Simplification of the underlying printed tones, the detail and chaos of the print imposed upon in order to for, be forced to adhere to the structure. These preconceived ideas regarding drawing in combination with the printmaking processes lend themselves particularly well to the articulation of the concept. The general assumption is that text is the most effective way of communicating, that there it is before us in black and white. We are able to read what is written many times over to clarify a position or idea. With this premise in mind, we share and read written communication, many of us publishing our thoughts regularly to the world without consideration that it too can be fallible. It assumes a certain level of comprehension within the readership and that words cannot be misread or understood differently. In this way, the prints I produce are an extension of the exploration with the books, raising questions about the foundations of our thoughts, communication, our understandings, beliefs and identity. Transition took the processes of uh, rendering in gridlock a stage further. Again, I'm referring to that piece there. <laughs> um, I began with one of my sculpted ball plates, a rubber ball which uh, just dissected wedding singles cut into the surface with a scalpel. As a font, I'm interested in its original purpose, as a fast and easy way of incorporating graphics onto the page of web designers and its lineage. Its roots are traceable from monistic illuminated manuscripts through to early printers right up until the emoji. The printed font was simplified through drawing, split into sections through photography, ordered and then given additional structure by the sections of the compositor's case. Through the text printed on the blocks, the simplified form is disrupted once more, the structure being not in the selection of words appearing on the surface, but through the subjective analysis of the tones provided in, in the drawing stage. 
In this respect, there is something appropriate about the act of returning to the printed page as the accumulation of process, particularly when we look at the materials used and the concept that is referenced. Neat indeed. Looks appropriate. <laughs> and the fact that the whole process that you uh, expressed is so full of references. They are many, varied and connected to each other in many ways. Uh, the fact that Emma uses books as an artistic medium, in that case, for example, but she is not a book artist, which is something completely different, is very poignant to our reflection in general, because what makes books her medium is the way in which she handles them, the way in which she manipulates and interacts with them. Now, before we have a very short break, I would like to focus on two of the practices Emma has mentioned, um, which are drawing and prints. She is, as she said, reversing the process. As, as she pointed out, drawing has been traditionally a tool for artists to take visual notes and to try and make sense of their work. So it was just usually the first stage of a long process, and although we today really treasure them, old masters would have barely considered their drawings as pieces of art in their own. They were just tools they used. But also, drawings had a vital role in the social evolution of the role of the artists in society. In fact, in the medieval times, artists were associated with artisans and the intellectual aspect of the artistic work was not recognised. During the Renaissance, artists tried and fought for the recognition of an intellectual status to their practice and drawing was a means for that. In fact, Renaissance artists started using drawing not only to create preparatory sketches for their final pieces, but also to explore the world. So if you think about Leonardo's anatomical drawings, they are so detailed, so accurate, and they convey the fact that they were not simply used to be able then in a painting to represent a leg muscle properly. They, their purpose was beyond that. Leonardo was exploring the world and getting to know reality through the medium of drawing. And this kind of exploration of the world was something that, according to the categories of the time, was seen as more scientific and therefore more intellectual. And the use of drawings then um, gained the artist the evolution in their social stages. And it, were, and it this process increased in the following centuries, in particular when official academies were founded. And with academies, the training of, of the artists moved from the artisan workshop into classes with tutors and with a structured training. And again, drawing, following the tutor's guidance, was the starting point of that process. So the medium actually was a tool not just to make sense of their final pieces, but also to increase uh, and to find a better, for the time, social status for artists. And it was the, f the first stage, traditionally, in the practice. It was the first stage. Prints, on the other hand, were graphic forms meant to be spread. Um, more than that, the technical evolution and the technical ability to reproduce in printing existing paintings had a huge impact in the development of styles. Uh, it prints, which is a technical ability, as a major relevance for the history of art as a discipline, because some styles would have never been developed if artists were, um, had not been able to know styles that were developing in other countries. In fact, if you imagine Caravaggio, for example, his art 
home owes a lot to the northern European um, everyday scenes that inspired him and let him produce the striking representations of sacred subjects represented as common people. Caravaggio was able to imagine something like this also thanks to the impact of northern European images that he couldn't possibly see in the flesh as in the 17th century traveling from Italy to, for example, the north of Belgium was a very demanding journey and very few people were able to undertake it. But Caravaggio was able to see prints of the northern European pictures and therefore that influenced is his art and his style. So again, drawing helped artists in, together with other things to improve their social conditions and prints um, influenced highly the styles that were developing. So other stimuli and other ideas of thinking about how strongly the material aspect can influence the whole artistic process. And thinking about how traditionally they have been used makes even more relevant how Emma today can take that ancient, those ancient practices and reverse <coughs> the order between printing and drawing. So now if you all agree, we can stand up, stretch a bit for five minutes, and then we will be back. Right, we'll just start again, and with Emma we, we have seen some quite unconventional media, such as the books used as artistic medium, and I said we will be back with more unconventional media. So I will let Jane talk about her view on the materials and how she uses them and how she handles them. Right. <laughs> well, as you can see from my work, which are textile pieces, paintings, um, some of the work that's in cartoons at the back, yeah, the back. Um, I, I work in a variety of media. Um, I've been des described as being rhizomic in the way that I work, because I, I, I will go along a path and then I'll take another direction and then I'll take another direction. But, but my themes always tend to be the same. Um, I'm heavily research-based work, so I read an awful lot about my subject matter. My themes are the continuing human condition, so I, I look at from the Paleolithic, Neolithic, through all the centuries to our contemporary time, and that's brought me to an understanding of how women have very much been left out of um, our common history. We're only just beginning to sort of rediscover the role that women have, have had in the past. I'm also interested in, in the state of our environment at the moment, and so a lot of my work um, will be about that. So for instance, the piece that I made at the back with the little gold fish coming out, which is called Premonitions of the Anthropocene, is about, um, about the time that the Anthropocene is supposed to have begun, which was 1945, was when the aqualung was developed by Jacques Cousteau. And so I, ironically, given the little figure sort of diving into the water and all the fish leaving the sea, the fish are plastic, and it's said that in 20 years there'll be more plastic in the sea than there are fish. So it's uh, created a sort of irony with that piece. Um, <clears throat> so I'm research-based, and I research um, ancient belief <coughs> systems. So the, my textile pieces um, really came about through looking at amulets, talismans, and fetish objects. And whilst those belong to an ancient belief system, people still sort of carry around with them uh, a special object. It, if you're religious, you might carry um, a symbol of your religion. Or people, if they're going on a driving test or taking an examination, quite often will have something um, special that they, they have to sort of help them. It's a, it's a kind of um, a subliminal thing, really. So the pieces that I've made, which I've called fetishes for uncertain times, have form but no practical function um, and they're really something that I've made uh, with a sort of agency about them in the same way that um, a fetish object that you might see from uh, you know an African figure with nails in has agency it has it has a, a power about it 
I've created these because at the moment we're living through these really uncertain times with, well, I don't need to mention Brexit, Donald Trump, mm -hmm. nuclear threat, um, and our environment sort of you know, causing lots of disasters around the world. Um, also with those pieces of work, I, after I'd done, been at art college, I did a fashion course, so I learned how to make clothes. Um, and I spent a lot of time making clothes myself, my kids, and sort of domestic furnishings and things like that. These were kind of like a letting go for me, because basically what I do is I cut out sort of random shapes, and I sew them together in a random order. There's obviously a little bit of choice in there. Um, but I end up with like a bag and just a sort of like a, a, a place I can put my hand in to sort of fill them up with, with wadding. So I, I don't actually know what the shape's going to come out like until I've finished it. And then onto the top of that, I just add what, a, what could be described as amulet devices, amuletic devices. So the buttons, shiny objects, beads, <coughs> twisted thread embroidery, knots. And these are all things that are supposed to be um, connected to amulets. Um, so that's all part of the sort of power of the object. And then the stands, I, I didn't really want to have them just on an ordinary plinth. So I was at the Hepworth a few months ago, and at the exhibition there, I noticed they had some quite nice stand that, that sort of allowed the air underneath the object. So we have a local blacksmith. I thought I'd go and ask him if he'd make these stands for me, which he, he very kindly did for a fee. <laughs> um, I feel like I belong to sort of like a long tradition of females making clothing, making fabrics. If you go right back to the beginning of time, um, women would have prepared skins much in the way that the, the Sami people or the Inuit people do. Um, and then felt was made and then, I mean, I, I do believe in, from what I've read that women probably invented weaving. Um, so I feel like I belong to a sort of long line of producers of things with cloth but also a long line through my family as well. You know, I learned to sew from my mum. My mum learned to sew from the female members of her family and back and back and back. Um, now, fabrics have always been regarded as being um, either homespun, which is what most people wore, or richly ornate embroidered silks, um, which were often kept in the coffers of kings and queens in the past because they were worth a lot of money. And that didn't really sort of change until it came to the period of the Bauhaus, which, which was just incredibly um, forward thinking and very socialist in its thinking, where artists were, were wanting to des design um, beautiful fabrics that anybody could wear. The Bauhaus didn't actually manage to make those things because, um, you know, obviously the Nazis came into power and, and people had to leave, but a lot of those people who left actually came to the UK or to America and so those principles were taken there and um, actually Bolton was one of the places where people started to sort of mass produce and design and the designers that make those fabrics are completely anonymous although there were artists who designed them we don't know who they are because a fabric doesn't have their, their name on it. Um, the feminist artists then of the 1970s sort of took up the idea of um, artists were a women's work, uh, what was regarded as women's work previously as being um, just as relevant in the art world as, as a painting or, or a sculpture had been. So uh, there's a more recent heritage from the 1970s that I would regard myself as being part of as well, which is uh, people like Louise Bourgeois, uh, Gita Bratescu, um, um, Dorothea Tanning, uh, who's also known as, um, she's really a surrealist painter, known as a surrealist painter, but I really like her, her fabric pieces of work. And all of those artists really work with more than you know, one material in the same way that, that I do. They work across a range of things. Um, the paintings, if I can move on to those, these are recontextualized from my um, fabric pieces. Uh, painting is just something that I really quite enjoy and I don't do it very often. I'll only do it if I've got something that I particularly want to sort of explore. But I, I, I've done a few paintings sort of over the last few years um, and I just really like the process of standing in front of an easel and trying to produce something that's in front of me. And so that's where they've come from. 
and I'm continuing to, to make those pieces. And just moving back to um, the unconventional materials that I use, I, uh, I'm a collector and I really love going to museums. I'm very grateful to my parents that they took me to museums when I was a really young child. Um, and one of the pieces that I collected fairly recently, a little anecdote, I was in France at a car boot sale uh, and I was at a bric-a-brac store with my husband and I picked up this little tiny hairy pot and I was just saying to my husband, I wonder what that is, and the lady came over and said, um, oh, do you know what this is? I said, no, 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 what is it? She said, it is a gazelle testicle. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, brilliant, how much is it? <laughs> So I, I have it sitting at home, waiting to be made into uh, a piece of artwork. <laughs> Talking about your collections and unconventional, could you quickly mention the stone dates? Oh yes, yes. The piece at the back is that I've called Dystopia. Um, everything within it <coughs> is dead. Dead wood, dead metal, dead bees. Everything is dead, the wax is dead apart from the stones from the dates. And in order to make those infertile, I covered them in, in gold leaf. And it also represents the, the silver and the gold, but if you no longer have bees, Darwin said after four years, human beings wouldn't exist. And therefore, silver and gold would not be of much value to us. Thank you very much. We will be back to the gold um, reference. But before that, um, I loved the connection with the Bauhaus, which in fact was something that your work made me think at first when I saw it, even before meeting you. And um, textiles, when I said earlier that we would be back with more unconventional media, of course I was thinking about the sushi plastic fishes, but also textiles, because as um, Jane said, Textiles usually, traditionally, would be, could be seen as unusual in a traditional commercial gallery, as they are not a traditional medium for those that are called fine arts. Now, this is not a traditional art gallery, so they are there. But this separation, and well, her work makes us reflect about this separation, which is currently in the present art world going on about the fine arts and the so-called crafts, so the other kind of techniques which are considered linked to the artisan sphere rather than the fine arts one. Now when talking about drawing I mentioned that in the past centuries artists wanted to see their work recognised also for its intellectual quality. So they had a long fight, and that process at some point worked. But that process, which had been positive until some point, then led to the creation of this strict boundary between the fine arts and the craft. And this apparently does not satisfy fully the entire artistic community, and the example of the Bauhaus tells us that it has not been doing so for more than a century now. So the Bauhaus was founded in 1919 by architect and artist Walter Grotius in Germany, and it was in its founding um, idea a democratic art core. So it was democratic in the sense that there was not a strict hierarchy between students and tutors, but rather it was created for sharing and collaborating. And there wasn't a hierarchy regarding the techniques either. So you could find there courses on the most varied kind of techniques. So you could have um, textiles as well as graphics, carpentry, metalworking, pottery, stained glass, wall painting, typography, even stage crafts, and these were all taught at the same level and with the same dignity as paintings and sculpture. And indeed, design was kept in a very high consideration because of complex social 
um, elements that had to do with the industrial um, improvement and with the new industrial era. So the Bauhaus and the members of the Bauhaus thought that the arts in this new era had to have a vital role in common people's life. And they even used some industrial processes and industrial materials to create the artworks in a ideologic, for, with an ideological choice. So using those materials for a practice which was an artistic practice um, aimed somehow to counterbalance the devaluing effects that the industrial boom was having on common people's lives. Um, and also, on the other hand, to question the elitist idea of the pure materials that were connected with the fine arts, again, in order to try and question this boundary between the techniques. So, as Jane said, no wonder the Bauhaus was closed down in 1933 by the Nazi regime, but its legacy is very strong and the fact that a living artist today can feel part of that tradition make it, makes it very clear. And also, I think its example is very relevant, again, to our general reflection about how choosing to use certain materials can be used to state even ideological positions and so to say something more complex than simply choosing an aesthetical value. And this aspect of the connotations of media that can influence the meaning of the objects that are made with such media um, helps me to connect with Tracy um, as about the gold aspect. So the Jane's use of the gold leaf in the dystopia piece she has talked about is quite unusual as she takes the gold for a rather trivial purpose to, to stop the stone to um, exactly. Um, but the gold, as a medium in general, has a very strong tradition of having significance. And over there, you can see more gold, but are they real gold pieces, Tracy? No, unfortunately, <laughs> they're not made out of solid gold. Um, uh, the bell jars are actually made out of gold craft paper, uh, decoupage paper. And uh, the wall pieces are just gold paper. Uh, in fact, even uh, other work that I've got which uses gold leaf uses fake gold leaf. Um, and, and actually, I find it a bit more interesting using fake gold leaf than real gold leaf because it, it, it sort of ties in with why I like the uh, material and the concept of gold in the first place. So I actually, I've only really started recently heavily using gold and it actually comes from my interest in landscape images which I've been working with for quite a long time now. Um, I was interested in, uh, more specifically actually, I was interested in reproduced images of landscapes in books and magazines that would typically be sort of reproductions of 18th century landscape paintings, but it was also other things which relied a lot on a very uh, manipulated view of nature, such as science fiction imagery. Um, I used to use uh, book covers from science fiction, uh, or I used to look research into uh, the use of landscape in John Ford's uh, Western films. Uh, all these genres where landscape was uh, metaphorically and conceptually very important. And um, it, it was that duality of sort of um, fakeness and realness which I found so fascinating. Um, so yeah, my, my use of gold actually comes from my interest in landscapes, which consequently led to an interest in ruins as well, and that has a link to the use of gold in my mind. 
because I find the 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 sort of the practice of conservation very interesting. Uh, the conservation of ruins. If, for example, you the, uh, you look back to the nineteen seventies, there was a real shift in how we treat ruins in our in our country. Before then, if we wanted to sort of protect or conserve a ruin, we would um, we would repair it in a way that hid the repair, so it looked like it hadn't been repaired. And in the 1970s, there was this shift which said that, oh, actually, you should make the repair look modern, so then you know what is, what is modern and what is authentic, you know, real, original stonework. And that, for me, is a really interesting shift um, in terms of how we how we like to look at the environment around us, how we like to conserve it, how we like to uh, articulate it as well. Uh, and that, that sort of uh, links to my interest in landscape, my interest in architectural ruins, the conservation of, but also my interest in gold, uh, both as a material and gold as a concept. Um, I find gold so interesting because it, it, it's so valued and it's so beautiful, it's so esoteric, yet it's so cheap and like nasty at the same time often. Uh, it, you know, you, it's actually, when you have gold in front of you, it looks uh, fake, you know, like uh, if you see a gold bullion, it looks like a fake gold bullion. You can't really uh, distinguish real gold from fake gold, and I find that very interesting. Uh, and it, and it, it, it sort of a bit reminds me of when I go to the Lake District and I feel incredibly conflicted the whole time because I'm looking at the Lake District and I'm seeing the beautiful landscape and the beautiful nature, but all, 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 I'm, all I actually feel I'm looking at is the sort of human artifice or human convention, the ideologies, the ideas that we put on the the Lake District, this idea of, say, Britishness that we associate with the Lake District, or this idea that, oh, let's go to the Lake District to escape or be free. It, it's a very sort of artificial idea that we place on something. Uh, so, no, it's absolutely not real gold, it's very fake. <laughs> um, uh, I, I do just want to say thank you so much, Sarah, for organising this. I found I found the int uh, and Solhe for putting it on. I found the relationship between materials and history really interesting, um, and it sort of awakened the idea in my mind. It's something I would like to think and work with more. Uh, partly because it does have that really strong link to my use of gold and. How, how certain materials do have such an interesting link to um, concepts of history, concepts of heritage, um, and I think it is an overlooked area of research that would be nice to, to think more about. Um, in particular, what meeting with you and hearing everyone speak has made me think about more is uh, this interesting place of being in between two-dimensional work and sculptural work uh, and this sort of middle ground. Uh, and also this middle ground of being between fine art and craft. Uh, I work in collage or paper cutting. or All of my work is with paper. And paper itself is a very crafty material. You know, the Belge works use very thin decoupage paper. Um, so there's a, there is a really strong craft uh, sort of line in my work. Uh, and I, I actually tried hard to go, to go sculptural. It was a real definite attempt by me. I, I, it was something I'd never done. I really wanted to push myself to do it. But really, I, I was never able to completely break away from the 2D. The sculpt, my most sculptural work, which is the Belge art, is basically just a flat 2D cutout, which I've suspended over a wire. So I really feel like I've faked it there, you know. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like a, a hung, flat work. <laughs> um, that's as far as I can go to be sculptural. But, like you say, 
there is this really interesting in in between space. Definitely. Yeah, and and I think there is there it does say something a little bit about this low culture craft uh, like decoupage, for example, and this high culture of um, sculpture and carving uh, and everything that you were talking about before. Well, apparently the separation wants to be questioned, or at least there are people who want to question it, so you will have uh, space to explore. Excellent. And about, <laughs> and about the sculptural quality, quality of your work, to me, the three, well, the framed and hung paper cut do retain some kind of sculptural qualities, both because from here, for example, I can see the three-dimensionality of the piece of paper, although it is a minimal three-dimensionality, it does um, have a shadow on the, on the black, uh, on the white <coughs> background, so I can see some tiny but still existent three-dimensionality, and also the process of the paper cut, to me, can feel more similar to carving than painting. So I can definitely see that connection. And in your work, to me, the hung pieces are more sculptural than the bell jars, actually. Oh, right. So it's interesting, and I'm sure you are pushing these boundaries. Going back to the gold and the use of gold, um, it is very interesting how Jane, uh, well, how Tracy decides to not to use the real material, but still she somehow relies on the meaning of that material, and she um, she is in a connection with us as viewers, as she knows we will connect when we see gold, we will connect it to a series of ideas and the simple look of it will evoke many meanings behind it. So even not, even just by faking it, she doesn't need anymore to use it, but simply um, having the appearance of it. It is partly of the method that she is conveying by choosing to use that. Now, the practice of faking the use of gold is as ancient as the Middle Ages, actually. Uh, there exists a fantastic technical treatise written at the turn of the 15th century by an Italian artist, which in his English translation is called the Craftsman Handbook. So it retains the artisan sphere in which artists were in the Middle Ages. And this is a technical treatise in which you can find almost all the techniques that existed in a traditional artistic workshop in the Middle Ages. So it's a real gem for anyone interested in the history of materials. And in the chapter about wall painting, the author spends a few lines about the application of gold leaf. And he says that gold leaf is particularly suitable for the figure of the Virgin Mary. So he states very clearly how strongly the material is connected to religious meanings and to the religious figure. And religion in medieval times was way more embedded in the daily life of people than it is today. Um, because of this, the author also warns about using fake materials, and he acknowledge, acknowledges the fact that gold is expensive, but he says that it works better than any other material, and in fact, and I'm quoting now, he states, if you wish to reply that a poor person cannot make the outlay, I answer that if you do your work well, and spend time on your jobs and good colours, you will get such a reputation that a wealthy person will come to compensate you. And, he, he adds, even if you were not adequately paid, 
God and Our Lady will reward you for it. <laughs> so, in his medieval conception, using the pure gold was a religious act, meant that the artist had a pure devotion and would eventually gain the artist the divine reward. So this is how strongly <clears throat> the material quality were connected to symbolic meanings in medieval times. And that's why um, he uh, pointed out that it was better not to use alternative materials, such as golden tin, which was a practice widespread, where he, as a purist of the practice, um, advised not to use alternative materials. Clearly, this doesn't apply to Tracy's work, as um, in her work, it's a, as she said, it is a choice that she is not using real material because her research is about a more complex, um, the more complex layers of the use of the material and the meanings behind it. But she is part of that tradition which starts from sentences like these. And this is in our culture, although we cannot be aware of it, when we see gold, the centuries of consideration of the material as a even religious object uh, influence the way in which we look at it. And um, the challenging of the two-dimensional and three-dimensional boundaries is also an aspect. And that's the aspect that will link you to our last artist, which is the Yana, as I feel um, there's a lot of challenging boundaries and exploring the textual aspects in your work as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just minded of uh, a conversation that uh, I had a long time ago when uh, the head of sculpture came in to look at some degree shows and uh, at a sweeping glance said, I, I love looking at the work of uh, the ceramics and silversmiths because it's so humble. And this kind of um, overarching uh, judgment about the difference between craft and fine art was just completely embedded in the whole art school structure. Um, to that extent where he felt he could make this sort of value judgment. And uh, I, I think, I hope that the, the, the work here and uh, the concepts that we've been dealing with kind of have um, gone past that. I mean, he was, he, was making, he was making a fool of himself, really, but he didn't realise it. But he, he could have said the same thing about uh, women. He could have said the same. You know, it was, it was that on that level uh, of, of judgment. Uh, but I think what all of us are doing is pushing those boundaries between two and three dimensions, between um, craft and fine art, uh, and between um, challenging all of these uh, set tenets that are, have uh, been the bedrock of um, uh, art history for, for so long. I mean, my, my personal uh, journey, as I hate to use that word, but uh, uh, that's where it's been. It, it has been uh, to get to the work where I'm, where the time is on the walls that I'm producing now. Um, I, I started off as a ceramicist and I learnt, uh, and when I was at uh, college, the process it was pure arts and crafts right from William Morris um, to the Bauhaus, where they, of course they had uh, similarly sort of um, craft-based departments. Um, so I learnt uh, my craft very thoroughly. People would stand and watch you and make sure you did the right thing. And, and that wasn't true in painting at that time, which allowed our fine art, our sculpture, so that allowed this man to make this sort of judgment because, of course, they were dealing with higher things, they were dealing with concepts, whereas we were just merely dabbling about in materials, weren't we? So, um, meanwhile, we did acquire skills and knowledge and craft, which very rapidly became unfashionable. Um, and certainly ceramics itself has, has gone through all sorts of uh, um, 
downturns, the, the, the industry as well as the um, studio Potter. But nevertheless, my journey has been that uh, I, I, I was doing that, I was teaching it, I was making things and I was uh, surviving on that. Uh, but um, I, I lost my uh, studio and uh, then recently found myself able to ha have a space where I could make things and not being able to afford a space that I could make ceramics in, I was thrown back onto my old skills of drawing. And, but I couldn't leave it at that. I was drawing, 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 but uh, I needed to get in there and manipulate the materials. So I, what did I do? I started messing about with the paper itself, and I was ripping it apart, and I was pulping it, and I was putting it back together again. Um, and so that's... Uh, kind of led me to do all sorts of large drawings as well, sometimes uh, two, three metres big, um, with crumpled paper and graphite and had a whale of a time. And then uh, from that I discovered this magic medium of gesso, which uh, I um, make myself. I don't buy the ready-made gesso because I prefer to be able to control the textures and the drying time. But what I like about gesso, what really fires me up, is that it, it can set very fast. So I like to draw into the material as it's setting. This means I have to be quick. And so I have to be quite focused, I have to have my setup, I have to have the materials, I have to spread them about, um, and then I have to work into them before it goes off. And this means that I work swiftly, and it keeps the freshness of the sketch, I believe. So that, because if, if you work on something over and over and over, it can get very laboured and very... Um, uh, tired and you lose that spark that you had originally both in yourself and in the material. The material gets tired like you do. Clay certainly gets tired uh, and you, 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 you can't do it anymore. So I like the fact that it, I know it's going to go off in such a, a time that I, I have to do it and, uh, and then I also put textures into the um, material, the mixture itself so sometimes textures from the place that I'm trying to represent in um, um, a modern contemporary version of the landscape, uh, sometimes very specific places but sometimes uh, generic um, landscapes. But because I live in the Pennines, I do tend to produce lots of uh, wet, gritty landscapes, so um, that, that's just the nature of what I'm looking at and what I'm living in, but somehow that feels right to me, that uh, what I produce is of the place I'm in, rather than being um, uh, somewhere else, so uh, that, that's, where, that's where I'm at at the moment, but then of course um, my other desire is to apply um, oil paints to them, because um, not only does it add colour, but it then it, it's, um, it has its own techniques. But what I find, what I found myself doing, and sometimes this, as, as everybody else has said, it's a conversation, it's a learning process with the materials, and I find myself applying oil paint very thinly at first, which is a traditional method of applying oil paints. You do it very thinly and then you, you build it up until you have the impasto layer. But the very thin layer I apply, and I start using, um, you know, I'm probably not doing my health very much good with this, but with terps and with solvents and so on, very thinly. And I'm rubbing it in, and I'm thinking, goodness, this is like ceramics. So I have this this surface which is very textured like ceramics, and and then I'm I'm um, putting. Um, tone and colour onto it and rubbing it in. And any of you who've done ceramics at any stage must have done this because you put oxides on and then you start washing them off and so it goes into the grooves. Uh, and it, it, all sorts of exciting things happen during that process. And, and that's, that's why I'm doing it and that's what I love and that's what is on the walls and that's what I hope that people see and that they get this sort of sense of... Uh, excitement that I do out of looking at the materials, but also I like to think of it as a metaphor 
for the landscape so that it's um, it does connect to other landscape traditions of the sublime and of the romantic tradition of uh, um, being in a landscape and feeling of it and feeling part of nature. So part of my process is actually going walking and being there and taking it all in. You know, I'm not necessarily uh, drawing so much at the time, but just experiencing it. And then when I'm actually focused and working in the studio, I hope that emotional engagement happens as well. And so um, this, this is what my work is about, and this is what's on the walls at the moment. Um, and I think what's interesting as well is, is the diversity in this group and the, the fact that each of us, uh, many of us, are, are producing work which is also diverse, so that we're not, um, you know, that, that we're, we're kind of, um, we're not doing uh, what is expected of artists to get a style and stick to it and do it for the rest of their natural life. Because um, personally, I, I find that difficult to do because I get excited by doing other things and I, I want to try this out and I want to try that out. And I certainly want to try three dimensions out. And now I'm beginning to get so excited by what Rachel's done that I almost tempted to go back to clay. <laughs> so, who knows where they, no, but it just, it just the excitement of it all, that yeah. uh, trying to get over to anybody who cares to stand and listen to me for more than two minutes. So, thank you. <laughs> we look forward to seeing where you would go next. Yes, so do I. <laughs> well, I think there are many aspects extremely intriguing in your practice. And I'd like to focus on two in particular that makes me think of ancient techniques and they really feel like a modern interpretation of past techniques. And the first one, of course, is the use of oil. The idea of manipulating oil paint so that the surface of the canvas is not completely flat, it has an old centuries tradition and it began roughly around the 19th century, when first some distinctive painters uh, began to explore other ways of using oil paint. As we have seen at the beginning, oil paint became to be fa favoured around the 15th century, and for many centuries, three actually, well, three or four centuries, it was used <coughs> to create very polished and flat surfaces. But then, at the beginning of the 19th century, some artists began to do things a bit differently. So William Turner is a great example. And his, the development of his career and the development of his use of oil paint is extremely interesting, as at the beginning of his production, if you can imagine some of the big pieces that are in the National Gallery, for example, he created the traditional polished, flat, luminous, brilliant surfaces as he was inspired by the old landscape masters, such as Claude Lorraine, whom he venerated. But then, gradually, when his aesthetical research developed and he became closer to the Romanticism and so his relation to the landscape became more immediate and more intimate. His technique evolved accordingly and his oil paint became more thick and he started working it not only with brushes but with spatulas and with his own fingers as well as I think Diana's, Diana also uses different tools. So that manipulation of the oil paint in a more and more textural way went together with the evolution of its, his relation to the landscape. So once more, a connect, there's a strong connection between the aesthetical and the concepts behind and how you manipulate the material uh, in contrast with what um, the teacher thinking that being able to manipulate materials was in contrast with having a concept behind, it is actually 
strictly connected. The second, the second aspect of your practice that makes me think, think of the past centuries is the underdrawing on the gesso that Diana mentioned. So in that black and white piece over there, you can go later and have a closer look, there are incised lines on the gesso. And these are the lines that Diana uses to uh, create the composition, the first the basic lines of the composition. So this was the traditional way of having the underdrawing on frescoes. Fresco painting, as the word says, is a painting in which the artist has to work on the plaster which is applied on the wall as it is wet, which in Italian is fresco. So the word means that the plaster has to be wet um, while the artist works on it. So that while the plaster dries, the colours dry with, them, with it and it becomes one with the wall. The colour becomes one with the wall drying off together with the plaster. So it gets embedded in the material. And that's why Frisco is so stable. But that, this means that the artist, as Diana says, uh, the artist has to be quick and work while the material is wet. And therefore, uh, artists used to have the underdrawing, which had been previously created on big cardboard, and then from the cardboard, they transferred the drawing on the plaster to be able to follow the lines of the composition because there was little possibility of fixing if they did something wrong while the plaster and the colours had dried off. So they had to be quick and precise. Additionally, very often, fresco decorations were undertaken by a master with his assistants, and so the assistants had to reproduce the master drawing, the master project, and therefore the original drawing created by the master was transferred on the wall. But what's incredibly interesting is that Diana is connecting to that tradition, but she's doing it in, in an innovative way, as you can still see the underdrawing incised on the gesso on her piece there, while originally it was meant to be covered by the colour. You can see it in ancient frescoes, but only with some specific kind of analysis. So again, it's a great connection and it's a great line in which you place yourself, but then always experimenting and working to find new solutions and new ways. So I think we can open up to questions. First of all, I would like to thank very deeply all the artists who have taken part and give them a round of applause. <laughs> It has been a real pleasure. It has been a long process, but absolutely brilliant. And you only got few stimuli and few ideas. I had long conversations with them, so there's much more than I forced them to say. Thank you very much for sticking to the time schedule. You have done it brilliantly. And we have time for questions, so I'm sure they would be very happy to answer if you have any in hearing about each other's practice, does that make you want to maybe try other techniques yourselves or other materials? Yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, Diana, Diana said something. Yeah, I thought oh, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, about yeah. It. Yes, yeah, I'm tempted to go back to Claire. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to know more about the people's work mm -hmm. because at the preview I just got a quick glimpse in a very crowded room and then we met one another and I heard a bit about what people were doing. I've heard a lot more now and so I suppose I've got questions about what they've said, yeah. And I think as well that artists take time you know, to absorb before they begin to create so it may very well be that each of us yeah. you know, at some point in time in the future will 
will remember these conversations and, mm. and think about, you know, oh, that's a possible way. Yeah, yeah. I think t- time is the uh, it, it's the fourth dimension, isn't it? it it's yeah. like what we all need in order to process that's exactly mm. right. uh, yeah. creatively. Yeah. 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 I think it's important to be um, quite authentic and true to your own practice, but I think it's also good to be open-minded to other influences that may, you know, be appropriate to, mm-hmm. to what you're kind of working on. Yeah. So, and I, I think with all of us, in very different ways, we're all quietly rebelling against something mm-hmm. in, in our own discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think, great. Go on, Paula. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the fascination with the organic comes through quite strongly in everybody's work. And I mean, when I first came, I was really intrigued with Jane's work and the way you presented the textiles in a very sculptural way. I found that absolutely fascinating. And mm-hmm. it just really captivated me to look at more and more and then to transfer it into a, a two dimensional drawing made me reflect a little bit on, on how shape and form. Uh, was seen both three dimensional and a two dimensional way. So I really, and and the use of colour and structure within it, I just found it really, really wonderful. Thank you. I, I've been working with fabrics for quite a, a long period of time, um, but I've been making more sort of figurative work. Mm-hmm. And it was it's really sort of like, again, that absorption of ideas. I'd put in a proposal for um, a biennial over in Ireland a couple mm-hmm. of years ago. Uh, where I wanted to do a sheen and a gig figure, and I wanted to take it from the sheen and the gig figure into something that was much more abstract. Yeah. I got rejected. <laughs> so, but I went back to sort of my sketchbooks, because I keep copious notes in my sketchbooks, and uh, that, and I was making a shaman costume at the time, yeah. and I was reading, I, was, I got uh, Louise Bourgeois' book on fabrics, and yeah. uh, I, I would reintroduce myself to Gita Progescu's uh, fabric works, yeah. Um, and, it, and, and again, Dorothea Tanning, as I say, um, seeing her at, at the Hepworth at the same time that I saw these um, different sort of plinths. And it, those things just all came together. I think that's what happens. All these things come together at some point and, you know, out pops your new I think it's very refreshing. It's very refreshing to see those sculptural pieces and textiles. That's lovely feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> And what's great about them as well, I like them, is it, the, the element of chance that you, with your skills, which mm. you obviously have, uh, to actually start manufacturing them. But as you say, you don't really know what the final no, I don't. item would be like, so that's fabulous. <laughs> and sometimes when they come out, I just think, oh God, that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but I make myself work with it, and as I work with it, I dig in and like it more. Do you think that it's still quite organic? Because I'm reflecting back to you know, Sue's work. Because your work strikes me as very organic mm. in the way it comes through with the natural cracking and fissures. And I can mm. see that in, in your landscapes as well with the gesso. Mm. I, mean, the I think it's interesting what Jane said about working with something that maybe you don't like. Mm. And what I find mm. is over the years, this is just a tiny selection of my paintings, but over the years, the, the, the paintings that I've wrestled the hardest with, that I've brought back from the brink, yeah. for me are the most mm. kind of satisfying or um, most rewarding, because yeah. they've been that close to, like, <laughs> being really <laughs> lost. There seems to be that point you get to, and you think, this is dreadful. This is yeah. like the worst thing, <laughs> I'm about to bin it, and yeah. then you think, no, I'll, I'll just, and then because, somehow because it isn't precious anymore, yeah. you just yeah. Yeah. do it, yeah. and it, yeah. oh, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> we've yeah. got, we're back on track now, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just yeah. Seems and then something magical happens, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a colour, you know, I love colour, but I find this work just, it really made me think more about tone and structure and just, you know, I think the simplicity of it is just um, quite phenomenal. Thank you. I, I think 
When you live with I mean, it's amazing how much colour there is in a black, and especially, um, I mean, this is all the same like black pigment, it's just that some of the divisions, the stripes have been waxed, and the other is just the raw mm -hmm. pigment. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing with natural light, um, and even artificial light, but mainly natural light, how how much the the intensity and the depth changes. Sometimes <coughs> it's reflective and sometimes it's absorbent. Mm -hmm. And I think obviously I've had the the experience of having lived with them over a period of time and um, it, it is interesting the fact that the light changes everything and how things come forward and recede. And the colour is reflected mm -hmm. as well. I think, I think the monotones are just really interesting because it comes out in the sculptural pieces as well. You know, because mm -hmm. the, the shape, the fact that they're one colour, the tones and everything is just... Oh, it's really good. Um, I just want to say that what's really exciting for me and um, my, my friend here is that being in amongst a load of female artists and that is it's not getting on a feminism, feminism um, hype, but it's just really exciting to be around female artists who are working in an expanded practice and elevating the status of feminine crafts, perceived feminine crafts, but also I think what's interesting is the way that um, you can tell you've wrestled with your mediums, you can tell there's an intimate relation with how you all talk passionately about the, the different medias that you work with, and that makes us exciting to hear and your passion to show through in the work, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it has been so great to yeah. work with them. Yeah. And it's very underpinned, that is clear, you, you research, you can tell, it just breeds the richness behind it, there's stuff going on, That's exciting too. <laughs> right. I think we can just enjoy <laughs> the rest of the evening. Yeah. You can have a look around again if you want. And thank you once more. Thank you so much to Catherine and Ian. And I must say, this exhibition was extremely well curated. It has been so easy to put together this group and to find elements of connection because it was all there. And it was really a fantastic event to be part of. So thank you, thank you for coming and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs>